Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Laura Hoffman of California Polytechnic State University and Ruth Baiki of Invenio. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not moderating webinars, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I'm a senior program manager in our Engineering for Global Development Department. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Emerging Markets, Top Information and Communication Technologies for Development and Hardware Challenges. Hardware-based social ventures are proliferating in global development, and programs such as One Laptop for Child have thrust the ICT 4D sector into the spotlight. At E4C, we're particularly interested in the challenges and solutions emerging in the hardware space. So we've invited today's presenters, Laura Hosman, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at California Polytech State University, and Bruce Bakey, the Executive Director of Invinio, to share key lessons learned from a macro-level study comprising insights from hundreds of experts, academics, practitioners, and end users on how devices and hardware can be better designed and built to function in the difficult conditions of the developing world. We thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Along with myself, we have Holly Schneider-Brown, Michael Mater, and Steve Welch. Uh, as you can see, there's a mixture of affiliations there uh, from IEEE and AFME. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on this slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presenters, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a global community over, of over 250,000 people, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today, such as access to potable water, off-grid energy, effective healthcare, agriculture, sanitation, and other issues. Along with our social media community, we have a reach of nearly 700,000. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition including professional engineering societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, just to name a few, as well as academic supporters such as MIT D-Lab, international development agencies like USAID, EWBUSA, and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy, and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on global development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in this series as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on the E4C webinars page. Uh, the URL is listed right there. Additionally, we have an archive on YouTube, so feel free to check that out as well. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. Um, you see it there, hashtag E4C webinars. Our next webinar will be on October 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with that Daniel Lang Tang, who is the Usen Family Career Development Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University. Our topic will be Water Sanitation and Hygiene, or WASH, in Emergency, Lessons Learned, and a Way Forward. It's an incredibly interesting uh, topic, and we invite you to join us. Visit the E4C webinars page for registration details. Or if you're already an E4C member, we'll be sending you an invitation to this webinar directly another reason to join us. So a few housekeeping items before we get rolling. 
On the screen you are now seeing, there are a number of different widgets on the dashboard at the bottom. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget allows you to submit any questions for the presenter. The Help widget is for inquiries about any technical difficulties with resources on how to use the software and FAQs. Share This allows you to share the link of this webcast with your friends and colleagues through 13 popular social media sites. And the Twitter icon allows you to post directly to Twitter from here. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey at any time. Now I know this is a lot of information, so always feel free to hover over an icon for an explanation. We have quite a few folks attending this webinar today, so we'd love to see where you're from. Using the group chat, please type in your location. All right, I'm uh, actually not able to see everybody, but I generally know that we have folks uh, that call in from all over the United States and around the world. So um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we are so excited that you can make it from all parts of the globe. During the webinar, you can use the group chat to type in any remarks you may have interact and interact with your fellow attendees. But don't forget to use the Q&A window to type in your questions to the presenter. That way we'll be able to keep track of those questions. I see some folks are already using Q&A to tell me their locations as well. Uh, welcome from Peru, Florida, Seattle, thank you. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may want to try opening Webcast Delete up in a different browser. Also, feel free to access the help widget for technical help. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour or PDH for the session, please follow the instructions at the top of our webpage, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. Also, please make sure to take a moment to fill out our short survey. Your opinions are invaluable to the webinar series. Without your comments and suggestions, it wouldn't be what it is today. So I'd like to take a moment now to give you a better intro to today's presenters. We have Laura Hoffman, the Assistant Professor of Political Science at California Polytech State University. Professor Hoffman has held prior academic positions at Illinois Institute of Technology and the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Southern California, or USC. She graduated with a PhD in political economy and public policy from USC. Her current research focuses on the role of information and communications technology, or ICT, in developing countries, particularly in terms of its potential effects on social cultural factors, human development, and economic growth. Her blog, giving insights on her fieldwork experiences, is listed at, on the slide that you are seeing. Our second presenter is Bruce Vakey, the Executive Director at Invinio, a social enterprise delivering the tools of technology to those who need it most in the developing world. He's leveraging his extensive experience in the renewable energy industry as well as 16 years at Sun Microsystems as a telecom industry expert to drive Invinio's initiatives which are centered on sustainable commuting, wireless broadband networks, and targeted capacity building through partnerships with local ICT entrepreneurs. His areas of expertise include wireless networking, eco data centers, DC power, and solar power. Mr. Bakey has published numerous white papers and articles on green data center operations and solar power and ICT4D. His background includes a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Michigan Technological University and Advanced Studies in International Business from the University of Wisconsin. We welcome you both, and I'm going to hand it over to Bruce to get us kicked off. Thank you. Well, the, today's topic is interesting from my view only because the last 10 years, Invenio has been quite active in deploying uh, all types of uh, computer technology in developing regions and uh, have been involved in the design and implementation and deployment of over 2,000 uh, computer labs in schools, healthcare clinics, and refugee camps in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Haiti, and in the Pacific Islands. And we've learned a lot along that path over the last 10 years of doing this, um, but in our discussions with uh, both ARM and USAID, um, they wanted to find out if everyone else was having the similar experiences with hardware, 
hardware failures, what works and doesn't work uh, when deploying these type of projects in the emerging world. And so um, with that, we decided to uh, embark on a, a study of what other uh, uh, practitioners, experts, and academics had been seeing in the field. Because, of course, what we have been finding is the most of the hardware coming out of Silicon Valley and the developed world was really not designed for going into very harsh conditions. And when we look at equipment that was, such as military spec, it was just not affordable or, or usable in, in the environment that we were going into. However, uh, there is a huge demand for ICT and computing and in the developing world for education, healthcare, e-government, um, and so the demand is there. But if we look back in history, the results and the failures on projects of the wrong equipment being put in place and uh, project failures, uh, we really needed to take a hard look at what's working and what's not working. And so there's been a, a technology mix, mishmash, so to speak, um, that what works here in our world doesn't necessarily work in the developing world. So the purpose of the study that we wanted to undertake uh, was to uh, take the, our InVideo experience and really uncover what everyone else was also seeing uh, as a deployed project. So really uncover what are the major challenges that other organizations, NGOs, government, and ICT experts were seeing. Take these findings and actually uh, uh, educate the, the technology world that with a few product changes, they can offer their projects to their products to a larger base, meaning not just to the developing developed world, but also in these emerging markets. And the hope for the study was to promote and uh, promote design and development for for these regions. That there is a market there. That there there is a growing ICT industry, and with the right products, uh, uh, that industry and the market can be very successful. So uh, with that, we started working, as I said, with USAID and ARM to really understand uh, what uh, other people were seeing in the market as far as failures and successes. Uh, document those and then present those out to the industry, the, the hardware industry, uh, to improve their product sets for, for these markets. So what we started looking at is not only uh, our own industry people that we work with and, and some technology salons that, w that Invenio hosted, but also how do we go out and uh, interview ICD practitioners, experts, and academics and uh, take that information and uh, uh, both in, from in-person interviews and online surveys and, and get those into a white paper. And that's where we opened up our discussions with Professor Hosman to, as an ICT for the academic expert on uh, the methodology and approach for going out and surveying the industry, both uh, in the field practitioners, uh, ICT experts, and academics working in the field, and properly putting a survey together that really can look at these challenges, document those, and put them in, in a format, a white paper that can be presented out to the industry. So Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about uh, the findings uh, as you uh, launched into this project. Okay, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Iana, for the introduction. So yes, it's my um, opportunity here to talk about not just the project, but also what we found from it. And just a few words more about the methodology. Uh, we used each stage that you see listed here on this slide to inform the next stage. So the, the industry-based tech salons where we sequestered some experts um, from industry together and asked them specific questions to cogitate over for a few hours, informed the interview questions that um, I conducted with these 36 experts from around the world. And by the way, most of these people wore two hats. So if they were academics, they were also practitioners, for example. And then we used the responses from the interviews to come up with the survey questions. 
And I just want to say before I flip it to the next slide that both the interviews and the surveys, um, after we had explained what this, this project was all about and asked the requisite demographic questions, I asked a completely blank slate, open-ended question to both the interviewees and those responding to the survey, and it was the following. In your own words, what are the top ICT for D challenges? So we did not want to prejudice any of our responders uh, with our own you know, priorities and actually the following questions we had broken down into categories, so we didn't reveal any of those categories first. But I think what we see on this slide is we have a winner. <laughs> uh, both the interviewees and the responders overwhelmingly, the top ict for d challenge was identified as being energy related, related to electricity, related to powering the hardware devices. Coming in second, and I actually wouldn't even say a close second, was cost, and we'll talk about cost next. And you know, as you can see, so durability and ruggedness tied with connectivity for third, if we're going to rank them, and environmental issues followed that. Now, having said that, and you can you know, read the, the rest of the categories here, or the responses here, none of these are unimportant. Um, these are just, you know, we wanted to know what was on the top of the mind of the people responding to these surveys, and definitely energy came out on top without question. But it was put to me to come up with the top five hardware challenges. So if we are to come up with the top five, here they are, in um, pretty much in descending order. But again, I need to point out that none of these actually work without all of the others being in place. So we have electricity coming in first, cost affordability being second, connectivity and um, environment-related issues being third, and maintenance and support. Actually, you saw on the previous slide that um, environment was fifth. But these, even though they're very close to um, the order that we saw on the previous slide, these were actually the categories that we had predetermined. So they hewed very closely to what we actually found with our respondents. So what comes next, but okay, before I get to the categories actually, I want to um, point out something that I actually found a bit surprising in that we thought for sure we were going to find a couple of responses that were more important, for example, if you were working in the realm of ict for d for 20 years versus someone who had just started, or whether you were located in Africa versus Southeast Asia. In fact, we cross-tabulated all of our responses against all of these demographic characteristics, and none of them were significant, meaning that these were the priorities across the globe, no matter your gender, age, location or experience or even length of experience. So our findings were very robust and quite uniform. But on to the categories. So as I mentioned before, you know, among our top category, the electricity, power, energy question, um, perhaps not surprising, everyone wanted to see low power and prioritize that and long battery life. And since the batteries that we use are really mostly rechargeable these days in your phone or in your tablet, Many, many people pointed out that they want renewable energy to be considered. And in terms of the devices themselves, that means that they're ready to be used with solar, so perhaps on a 12-volt on a basis. Um, people wanted us to inv avoid using inverters when possible. So your solar panels, for example, produce DC power and the devices charge on it. So many people pointed out, well, if we can come up with a great you know, charge controller regulating that current, we should avoid using AC power and inverting it and re-inverting it just to be able to charge the devices. So, but that's for devices um, that, sorry, the solar is, um, interestingly enough, was mentioned by a lot of people. On the next slide, you'll see something that wasn't actually mentioned by a lot of people until we came up with the categories, which was, Again, on this slide, you can see that even within this category, the most important um, facet of the power, energy, electricity question became that people wanted devices to be resistant to voltage spikes, dips, swings, brownouts, blackouts, etc. The things that happen if you're connected to a grid, but the grid is unreliable or unpredictable, and that happens very frequently. So. Just once again, underscoring the importance of having open-ended questions and closed-ended questions because you get you know, a little bit different responses, although in the, in the main, 
our responses were quite uniform. But I just wanted to point out that once we actually asked the closed-ended question, yes, we got the um, we we were able to capture the resistant to voltage spike importance that uh, people had. Otherwise, you can see on this um, chart that you know little power, um, the 12 volt DC issue, and having long battery life was important. However, this also was able to capture the idea of using passive cooling and not having um, fans be needed to cool off equipment. So there's our power, energy, electricity category. Moving on to our next category of importance, we have cost affordability. And one other thing that I found interesting here was almost no one insisted on having things that were the lowest cost as the highest priority. Nearly everyone recognized that there needs to be a balance between finding that lowest cost or finding a lower cost and having a device that's solid, reliable, and isn't going to break down. So apparently there's enough experience out there with people having devices that do break down and might be the cheapest thing out there. And maybe in the Western market, you know, if you buy the, the lowest cost tablet, but you're okay with it breaking down after six months because you know the next tablet is coming out within the next six months, that might work for you. But in a developing world location where you're not able to invest in a new tablet every six months, people want something that's going to last. So there was really widespread recognition between the, the lower cost challenge, but also the challenge that things need to keep working. So, so Laura, if I could just add a com comment uh, on cost and affordability. I know that a lot of the projects that Invenio does, you know, the funders look at, oh, what's the hardware cost of this laptop or desktop? And in when we look at all the components of doing an ICT for D project with uh, the hardware costs, the uh, infrastructure for energy and internet uh, training, long-term support and, and uh, maintenance, that the hardware cost is normally only about 8% of the whole project cost. So um, it's, everybody wants affordability, but when you look at the bigger picture, um, it's, it's, it's actually a small part of the overall pie. And in a similar way, um, people pointed out that it's actually quite difficult to calculate the real true cost of buying a device since it is so difficult to predict whether that device is going to last um, and how long it you know, will be before the device breaks down or how much training we'll need to understand how to use it or... Um, how much electricity it's going to use. So that was also pointed out quite frequently. How do we know what the true cost is of a device? And that makes things more difficult. So on to our next category, which was um, environment-related issues. And one thing I found very interesting in this particular category was when I was asking people from the developing world, or I should say interviewing people from who were located in the developing world, and that was approximately half of my interviewees, maybe a little more. The topic of what I would call Mother Nature-related environmental issues, so more e-waste or um, rare earth mineral issues, perhaps, didn't come up in the interviews unless I actually prompted them about it. Whereas when I was speaking with those who were located in the wealthier countries, I would say, they had a pretty equal half and half um, perspective on the mother nature issues versus all of the other bullet points that I've got listed here of reliability, durability, you know, waterproof, water resistant, humidity resistant, salt water resistance, extreme heat, dust, et cetera. So, not to say that there isn't um, an appreciation of, of the Mother Nature-related issues in the developing world. I think it's coming, though. I think that that's more of an emergent issue, and the more urgent concerns are basically, um, will the devices work in these more harsh conditions? So these were some of the, the uh, issues that were raised. And I would also point out that I found it interesting um, that for those who are working in, let's say, remote villages, um, it, it was frequently pointed out, you know, we have to work outside and the sun is pretty bright, so it's extremely difficult to read tablet screens or phone screens in the direct sunlight. But also, in my village, the people 
put oil on their hair because it's a desert climate, and then they put it on their face and their body, and guess what? It's on their hands, and it gets all over the screens when they go to use their devices. But we heard similar things from people who are working in schools because multiple children are using tablets. And that means that the screens get scratched or smudged or cracked when 10 different hands are grabbing for them. So we heard pleas for um, reliability, ruggedness, and, and just better designed screens from, from those types of people. And here's a more visual way of putting the environmental category um, responses. Uh, Bruce, did you have any examples to add here? Well, I think from our experience, um, uh, having passively cooled equipment from an environmental standpoint is, uh, from a long-term reliability is, is, is a key factor, meaning can, can we choose devices that are passively cooled, meaning there's no fan, and of course when you have a fan, it does suck in all the dust, dirt, uh, and uh, humidity. And a lot of the early hardware failures that we've come across were just because of that, that the system becomes clogged with uh, bugs, uh, 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 geckos, uh, dust, etc., and the equipment fails after 6 to 12 months, where passively cooled equipment doesn't have that issue. So it really, um, uh, these are, you know, key things to look at when selecting equipment because they do have an effect. Okay, and moving on to the next issue of connectivity, and I know that I've got this, you know, listed third, um, but it's actually essential. So, you know, as I, I said before, none of these issues can be ignored. They're actually all useful. If you're missing any of them, you can question whether the device is ever, you know, going to be useful. So many people pointed out that the connectivity is actually itself what's creating the value for the device because the more of us who are connected, be it through a mobile phone where we can speak or text or otherwise chat with others, the more people that are connected, the more valuable the network. It's the same with being online if you're on a social network. The more people that you know who are contributing to it, adding information, the more you want to be connected yourself. So. But there's more to it than that, actually. Um, if we skip down to the bottom point here, most software, most operating system updates, most apps are only available online. So the things that people want on the devices that are going out these days, people realize that you have to be connected for there to be value. And in fact, the only caveat to that was that in the area of education, People believe, and I guess it would also be in the case of libraries or community centers that house information. Information can be cached offline and curated, and in that way it can become useful for schools and libraries, et cetera. But these were truly the only examples that were given to me in all of this research where devices were deemed useful without connectivity. So going on to a more visual representation, we also heard that Wi-Fi is the most popular um, way to get online according to our respondents. That's what they wanted to see. And they also wanted to see multiple ways to connect. But not to be outdone in <laughs> essential um, things to consider, maintenance and support. So I heard over and over again, the best technology needs no support. People want things to just work. This is not just because of all of the other bullet points we have down here that you know there's a lack of local technology experts to be found in many rural or um, far-flung locations, but also spare part sourcing is really a challenge. It's tough to get parts that are, that are going to be um, needed on a consistent and regular basis. It's difficult to predict which parts are going to be needed, and it takes a long time for them to get there once that's the case. So if technology is not locally sustainable, not locally repairable, it's not going to be useful for people um, living there because it's not going to be repairable. So truly, and, and you know, I'm underscoring this with all the other bullet points, the best technology needs no support. If people need to get on ex um, unreliable dirt roads and travel long distances in expensive vehicles that use expensive gasoline, that adds a level a layer of cost that's just truly unsustainable for a lot of businesses and a lot of people in the developing world. So 
um, I can't underscore enough, this is actually our final category, but it's no less important than any of the others. It's absolutely essential. So the next slide has a lot of, a lot of words on it, but we actually asked two questions about hardware in the survey, and this is the condensed version of what was deemed the most important among the two questions. So interesting to me that touchscreen doesn't necessarily rate as important as um, readable in sunlight, for example, or easily repairable, but some of the highest ranking ones were the, the environment, actually going back to environmentally and electricity. So perhaps not surprising to see right in the middle of this graph, electricity um, or robustness to electricity with standing heat and humidity, the price. So all of these important features coming right back up when we ask about the general hardware features. So just to kind of sum up all of these graphs, I've summarized the top categories with, or the top responses, I should say, within all five of the categories that we determined. So no surprises here. We've already gone over this. So among electricity, we want the long battery life. We want it robust to um, the swings and spikes and outages and the 12-volt power. Within cost, sure, we're looking for a low upfront price, but we also want to know that the long-run price is, is affordable as well. In the environment category, we've, we want devices that withstand heat, dust, humidity, sand, et cetera, and have a long lifespan. <laughs> Our demands are high. Yes, they are. <clears throat> um, we want devices that will connect in multiple ways, and especially with Wi-Fi. And finally, <clears throat> devices need to be easy to repair so that they're locally sustainable. So I'm so going to Laura, back I... over to Bruce. So if I can comment on a couple of these, you know, one of the challenges that we always come across are a lot of good uh, meaning donors that, you know, have a school in a rural area um, and say, oh, we'd like to donate a computer lab, but haven't thought through the challenges of, co of infrastructure, meaning the power and connectivity. And uh, a lot of the projects that we see fail are because of those infrastructure issues. And uh, the issue is not to, you know, buy a uh, gas generator and fuel every day for running a computer lab, that if we design the equipment properly you know, that's low power but still has uh, the, uh, the horsepower to run the applications needed for that school lab, we can uh, cost-effectively solar power that. Um, if we look at the inexpensive uh, uh, Chinese-made uh, uh, generators that are being sold in the developing world now, um, there's a recent statistic that uh, the, the uh, environmental uh, output of those, meaning the pollution, is equivalent to 100 of our uh, modern cars. Um, that's really not the answer anymore, and we have to, uh, as uh, people working in the ICT for D field, need to take a hard look at how do we uh, environmentally power this equipment so that it isn't having an impact and that uh, gasoline and diesel generators are not the answer uh, to solve the energy issues that are, are occurring in, the, uh, in these markets. Uh, on the cost, as I mentioned earlier, 8% of the uh, project cost that we see is, is only attributed to hardware. So I know a lot of people focus on getting the, the lowest cost equipment, but in reality it doesn't hurt to, as you said, buy, uh, look at uh, equipment that's proper and just cost uh, just a fraction more and is the right equipment to go in there. Um, because it is such a low part of the entire project cost. And the environment, uh, you know, um, these schools, healthcare clinics, refugee camps are not air conditioned. They're not environmentally controlled. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to deal with the environmental issues of dust, heat, humidity, et cetera, and this equipment has to, has to uh, withstand that. Um, and then the area of connectivity, that's a, a big challenge, and there's a a lot of efforts underway for uh, affordable internet in the developing world and, and bringing more bandwidth. But when we, while we're in major cities, uh, that's becoming uh, more accessible and cost affordable. We still have major challenges in the rural areas in the developing world to have uh, affordable internet connectivity if you can find connectivity at all. And that's a challenge that uh, industry is 
is taken up, but uh, it's still years away before we see uh, Internet access as we have it here in the West. And then the last area in maintenance, uh, one of the things that we've been promoting is buying uh, all equipment in country and finding local suppliers. The big thing that we have seen change over the last 10 years, of course, is that a lot of this equipment is available in the market, or if you uh, request it, it can be brought in and supported locally. And that's the key thing is if you can buy and support the ICT equipment that you if you can obtain it locally, then you have local skilled people that uh, can support and maintain it on the long term. And, that, and that's critical in any of these projects um, to see that they're still operational in two to three years, that they didn't fail because uh, a small part wasn't available or no one, no one knew how to repair something and, and it's just left like that. Um, uh, so uh, the long-term support and maintenance is critical and uh, and we believe by sourcing locally the equipment that you want um, and buying what's available in country and, and adopting it to your project, that that's a way to address that. Um, Laura, would you like to uh, uh, conclude what you saw in the paper? The, the point, honestly, of this project was to launch a, a discussion, to get people talking, to have people understand what the true challenges are according to a great mass of people who have expertise in this area. And we, we believe that, um, personally, I believe that, there, that the hardware itself has been understudied in, by those who are doing research in this area. So there are, in fact, my area of expertise, I consider the socio-political economic um, realm of ICT4D, there just aren't that many people out there who focus on the hardware itself. So this, for me, this was a welcome um, challenge, but also it's an important addition to our understanding of the challenges facing ICT4D. It's, it's often overlooked, and these were essential findings, um, particularly you know, what is important. And once again, just underscoring, wow, electricity carried the day. So, I'll hand it back to you, Bruce, for, for more concluding remarks. So what's going to happen next with this white paper that's now been published and available for these challenges is, uh, in fact, this, uh, this uh, webinar is the first kickoff of going out to the industry talking about uh, uh, what is needed better in hardware design so that the equipment can survive in these environments and is becomes more locally available. And in fact, next week is the ARM Developer Conference uh, that I'll be attending to discuss with uh, developers from uh, Silicon Valley on how a few minor changes, such as the voltage that, they run, that the equipment is designed to run on, uh, the, the uh, path of cooling, et cetera, that can make a huge difference in these marketplaces and open up their products to a bigger market segment and, uh, and what these key features are that are needed in the next generation of hardware so that it truly becomes world-class hardware, just not uh, hardware for our Western world. And so uh, we're quite excited that uh, we're kicking this off uh, today and getting this, uh, this message out to, uh, to the hardware industry uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, that there's another part of the world that's out there and they need to start considering that in their, de their designs of, that they're putting into products today. And we are continuing to, as Bruce said, we're excited to launch this today. This is actually the first time uh, that, that the results of this report are being uh, disseminated. In addition to re presenting this to the technology community that Bruce is doing and mentioned in Silicon Valley in the coming weeks, um, the subsequent week after he's doing that, I'll be presenting uh, this information as well at the IEEE Global Humanitarian Technology Conference, also in Silicon Valley. Uh, we'll both be presenting it there. So we, this is just the start. So we're, we're very happy to uh, have the opportunity to launch it here. And if you'd like more details, the paper is available publicly, um, and you can, uh, you can download that paper from the Invineo website, uh, and here's the look for that. Uh, it's also uh, 
uh, moved to the front of the Invineo homepage for this week so you can get access to that. If you have any questions or issues, here's my contact detail at Invineo. It's quite simple, bruce at invineo.org, if you have any uh, further questions after this seminar. Um, but uh, we're, as, uh, as Professor Hosman said, we're quite excited about uh, launching this and getting this information out to the industry um, uh, because there are a lot of good lessons learned over the last 10 years and recently of, of experts in the field that are seeing these difficulties and challenges. And uh, if we can uh, work with the uh, hardware and the, uh, the hardware design industry to make some uh, simple but effective changes, uh, we can, uh, this equipment can uh, really be effective as the developing world uh, implements more ICT in schools, government, healthcare clinics, uh, et cetera. This is absolutely fantastic, and we are so honored here at E4C to be the first <laughs> to uh, share the findings of, of this study. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up uh, and invite our attendees to share any questions. Uh, we already have a number of questions that have come in, so, so we're going to go ahead and get started. But just a reminder to folks to use the Q&A window in order to enter your questions. Um, uh, Professor Hoffman, um has already shared uh, also, uh, or actually somebody else has shared the link to the white paper, so feel free to look at that as well. So uh, the first question we're going to tackle here is for both of you, and as it impresses for you to comment on the idea of having continuous hardware reviews based on these identified challenges. So something similar to PC PCMag, um, et cetera, testing. Bruce, would yeah. you like to field that one? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so, you know, and that is a challenge is, you know, because there are a lot of, as ICT has become less of its own segment, but now embedded into e-government, into education, healthcare, agriculture, and the cost of a lot of equipment has come down dramatically, especially in the sensor and now how do we gather that sensor data in re rural areas and, and bring that back and, and make useful information of it. Um, so ICT is embedded in all of these, but as people in those uh, segments go out and implement, they don't necessarily know what's the right equipment to go in to a rural healthcare clinic or school or government office. And uh, so there is no, um, you know, uh, as we have here in the United States, a consumer's report on, you know, hardware, uh, you know, that's going to, you know, withstand the environment of, of the developing world. So there is a need for uh, uh, industry to start, you know, promoting uh, which equipment they're manufacturing that will survive in that and have, a, you know, an independent uh, uh, body uh, testing and, and putting those results out. Nothing like that exists uh, currently, but I think there's as ICT becomes uh, more embedded into these uh, vertical segments, it's going to be a, a needed uh, uh, information for, for the industry. I would Thank actually you. mention that Invineo has begun testing um, certain equipment for and reporting back about that equipment for um, you know, the harsh conditions it found in the developing world. So I don't know whether Bruce didn't want to advertise too much <laughs> about Invineo, but... Well, we, we've had our own testing lab here at Invineo uh, since we've started, you know, because we needed to find which equipment would work on our projects. And so we've done our own internal testing, as I, we know other people have done, uh, for their own projects. Now, we have uh, have done some uh, testing for other organizations to assure that the equipment that they're sending out will survive in these environments. Uh, but there's, there's – uh, but uh, – We've done that for our own internal use, uh, uh, mainly to date. Well, we're very excited to hear that because, in fact, the first C's uh, team has been working on exactly a platform uh, that would capture and disseminate that information. So, for all of you listening, um, the future is looking pretty bright, and hopefully, we can work with Invineo to pull some of that those findings out into uh, the public realm. So uh, moving on to additional questions, we have uh, a question that we'll also have to tackle uh, by text, but uh, just uh, for everybody's benefit, this uh, 
question from a telecommunications engineer uh, who is uh, based in Africa. And he wanted to know that he does a lot of ICT maintenance work. And his question is regarding challenges in the area of software compatibility. Um, it's difficult, apparently, to get um, what he calls genuine software to remote parts of Africa. So perhaps you can um, speak to uh, that particular issue a little bit. Um, also related to that, uh, uh, just in general, you know, although uh, ideally the best technology needs no support, as you mentioned, uh, Laura, um, frankly, that, that's uh, often not the case. And uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to what is being done um, as far as you've seen uh, to build capacity, uh, especially uh, locally, uh, for providing support. Again, I... <laughs> I don't want to toot in Vinio's horn too much here, but I actually started um, volunteering with them nearly a decade ago because I so much, so strongly believed in their model of partnering with the folks on the ground where they work and building those local capacities there and um, you know, bringing them up to speed but then empowering them to run their own um, ICT enterprises. and. That model, I've advocated in my research and I've advocated it in my action-oriented, on-the-ground research. It's, it's so important to have the local people trained. I know Invineo is continuing to, um, to espouse this model, and I think that it's catching on. That is my impression, but not everywhere and not at all times. We still face challenges around the globe. Um, perhaps oh. Bruce can speak to that more. Well, I think that you know the key challenges, especially around software compatibility, are, is a whole other study in itself. Um, this mm -hmm. one we really focused on the hardware-specific challenges. And if we look at these projects, you know, there's four, um, uh, five key factors that are involved in making a successful ICT per D project. And you know, and that's one as we've talked here today you know, making sure that we have the right hardware that's appropriate for the environment that it's going into. Second, that we're using the right operating system and set of applications uh, that are going into the, these environments, that those have been properly chosen for, for, for the need. Uh, third, that, we, that there is proper training of the users, teachers, healthcare workers, et cetera, so that they can uh, uh, Use the applications and and the tools that you know that this was supposed to be bringing to them. Fourth, that we do have long-term support and maintenance, uh, and then the last one that the uh, issues of in, in the infrastructure have been properly addressed, meaning energy and connectivity. So mm -hmm. while today we focused on the you know what the hardware side of it needs, um, you know the second key area has the right software been chosen, has the right operating system been chosen for that particular project's needs. And uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of times we see a lot of people just default to what we're using here in the West when it really isn't the right application set. You know, it's just like taking one of our big desktop computers and trying to power that and use it in a rural school. It's not going to work. It's just like taking the same set of applications we're using here and trying to apply them there. Um, that is uh, that is an issue with software compatibility, and I'll say more from is it the right software for that pro project? I would actually I like to add okay. something on that, mm -hmm. not just about the software, but about all non-hardware related issues as the researcher here, and that is that no matter that I set up all of the interviews and all of the surveys by pointing out that this is about the hardware challenges, I would estimate that at least 30 to 40 percent of the responses were about non-hardware challenges <laughs> because people, those are still real, right? And people recognize mm -hmm. that they are. And when you read the report, and I obviously encourage everyone to go online and download the report and read it, those issues get more um, space. Even though mm -hmm. we were asked to focus on the hardware, we did, we, out of necessity, we had to talk about the non-hardware issue challenges because they were so pervasive and so important to people. And so those do get more airtime, if you will, in the, in the report itself. I cut them out of this particular presentation for lack of time and just to focus you know, on message about the hardware. So, but they were really well, important to people. Thank you for setting aside um, that uh, note so that we can all take a look 
and get a little bit better uh, acquainted with additional uh, research on that topic. So, um, Bruce, you started to speak to uh, the power challenges, and, and that's a great segue to uh, a next question here that came in uh, regarding uh, or referencing the One Laptop for Child project and uh, their work in developing a hand-cranked power, uh, powering option uh, for their laptops. Uh, can you share a little bit more about uh, some of these kinds of approaches, alternative powering schemes, if you will, uh, and uh, maybe some experiences with those? So, um, well, specifically on the One Laptop, one laptop per child project that while there was a prototype with a hand crank, it w really wasn't feasible and it never went to production like that. Now one credit I'll give them is that in their charging, you know, two things they did well with that. One, there's no fans. Uh, second, that it ran at 12 volts and they actually uh, uh, put in some software into the charging so that you could actually connect a solar panel to it directly without going through the traditional charge controller. Uh, that a solar system needs. So, um, so there's some interesting things that the OLPC project did with their hardware. Um, so, uh, but on energy specifically, you know, the big challenge in the developing world is that the economies have outstripped the, you know, the grid systems that were built back in the 60s and 70s in most of these countries, and it hasn't kept up with generation capacity as well as build out of the grid network. So while we look at major cities, second-tier cities uh, may have grid power, the reliability of that system was, uh, is not there uh, with the problems with uh, power spikes, uh, dips, brownouts, and blackouts, uh, you know, plays a heavy toll on any type of computing equipment. Um, but what we're seeing now emerging, of course, is the whole concept of microgrids and having those uh, powered with renewable energy, uh, mostly solar. And so most of the projects that uh, we've worked on, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, have had a solar uh, element to that because of the, the either unreliable power grid or uh, lack of a, of a power grid completely. And so we've had to address that. So the, you know, the real advances that we've seen in the solar side is that the cost has come down from an industry standpoint that more local expertise has emerged in these regions and uh, the systems have become affordable. And using the right ICT equipment that uses low power um, and, and it can be directly solar powered really plays into, uh, into that uh, infrastructure energy equation. Um, because what we don't want to see, as I mentioned earlier, is you know, having energy as an afterthought and, oh, we'll just buy, you know, uh, electric uh, generator is uh, is cheap, but uh, unfortunately still uses fossil fuels, and in most of these places that is an imported uh, uh, commodity that's very expensive. Absolutely. I, I could mm -hmm. also share a little personal vignette about the hand crank, if if time allows. Uh, absolutely, know, we, go for it. Okay. So I actually had to stifle a giggle when you read that question because <laughs> almost every time we make a, a big present or a, a present to a larger audience, we get a question related to the OLPC hand crank. And <laughs> even though, as Bruce mentioned, it was a prototype, somehow that image has stayed. It's got staying power and resonates with people. And so we're always asked about it. So Bruce and I, a number of years ago, were actually working on a One Laptop Per Child project with students of mine, and every semester I got, well, the folks at OLPC were kind enough to give us one of those hand cranks that had been a prototype. And so every semester I got to demonstrate to my students, who also had that question, what about the hand crank? And honestly, after five minutes of cranking, they were exhausted <laughs> and done. And these are college students. So, mm -hmm. and it hadn't, you know, even charged the laptop for a few minutes. So, at least it was able, you know, having something in your hand, it was able to show them why this didn't actually go beyond prototype stage. But somehow that image is truly enduring, and it, it seems to resonate with people. So, but once you've you've seen that it, it's exhausting, even for you know, brawny college students after five minutes. <laughs> um, that's one of the reasons why it didn't actually catch on. 
there's something to be said for capturing experiences like that and, and really mm -hmm. getting them out there along beside the marketing. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I have a question that came in here, and I think this is incredibly valuable. Um, we're talking about the fact that we're going to be sharing this information in Silicon Valley, and there's obviously quite a bit of um, you know, work that you guys are planning to do to uh, really um, kind of get folks to understand these challenges and what can be done. Um, I think this question is probably around the inclusion and, and dissemination of the information uh, amongst Indian and Chinese ICT4D hardware pro uh, production um, organizations, whether manufacturers and designers. Uh, obviously, there are devices that are proliferating uh, out of those countries. So um, would you mind speaking a little bit about uh, both how you integrate those points of view as well as how you intend to uh, share the findings? Well, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons we're, you know, for example, attending the ARM Developer Conference next week because it is made up of the industry people that are designing around ARM processors. And those mm -hmm. processors are going into, you know, the majority of tablets, uh, uh, cell phones, et cetera, that are, are being made uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. So. Uh, there is a good representation of the industry that attends these conferences that are based here. Um, there are some other development developer conferences for hardware that are held in uh, Singapore and in China, and so we're also looking at uh, uh, how to get included into those uh, those conferences also. But we're starting uh, in our backyard here in Silicon Valley. But uh, yes, the uh, the Southeast Asia uh, markets and uh, developers are, are on our target list. Fantastic. And we have a, a very, we're going to swing right to a very specific question, uh, obviously from a, a technical standpoint. Uh, this uh, particular attendee has been practicing ICT for 45 years now all over the globe and is, is really curious uh, about uh, your advocacy for 12-volt DC uh, power supply. Um, he notes that the telecom industry runs off 24 volt DC and 48 volt DC. So uh, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, he's worked with renewables and is just curious. So from that standpoint, uh, we're using 12 volts DCs, I'll say more generically, as one of the outputs from a solar uh, design system. And he is correct. There's uh, also 24 volts DC and 48. And so minus 48, for example, is a telecom industry standard. So um, I, the whole point of that conversation is that we can look at using DC systems more than doing power inversion, uh, using an inverter to go from, uh, from DC to AC and then converting it back to DC to power the device. So that, uh, as we've seen in most of these uh, environments, uh, especially in rural solar, the, the inverter is the first thing that goes because it's been overstressed and overused or undersized. And so if we can eliminate that, uh, that, that, that DC to AC to inverter, um, we end up with a more reliable system. So if we have computer systems that are designed to run uh, at 12 volts, 24 volts, or 48 volts DC, then they can be powered directly off a solar system. So uh, we're using 12 volts DC as uh, more of a generic term that it can be powered directly off a of solar system. Fantastic. So we are at time. So perhaps uh, really quickly we can wrap up with one uh, kind of fun question um, that you guys can uh, take us out on, which is what technology do you travel with when you travel? That's to both of you. <laughs> that is a fun question. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, I've got my laptop and my smartphone, and I I don't use a tablet myself because I don't the form factor isn't the right one for me. So I still carry, but but my laptop has a solid state drive in it, so there's no moving parts in the in the uh, high humid and <laughs> dusty salt air <laughs> environments. And obviously, same with a phone, no moving parts. Cool. So cool, Bruce. And well, mine's a little bit different only because I do a lot of demonstrations. So I've got a, a lot of technology that I carry with me to show examples of how people are using tablets, laptops, um, uh, travel with a small Raspberry Pi Rachel server.
to show how uh, you know that can be used for offline content server, and uh, and so um, it's, uh, so I've got uh, quite a bag full of uh, equipment only because it's more for demonstration and showing what's possible. Um, uh, uh, but as as Laura said, my laptop, for example, does have a solid state drive. Uh, after uh, you know, having too many laptops dropped accidentally while traveling and having hard drive failure. So, um, um, uh, but uh, uh, and as well as I travel with quite a bit of Wi-Fi gear, once again to show what's possible with uh, with point-to-point Wi-Fi and low cost uh, uh, kind of uh, setting up low cost uh, broadband networks using that technology. So most of mine is for for demonstration purposes, not for supporting me while I travel. Sounds like a heavy load, nonetheless. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. With, uh, I love this what's in your bag question. I think we might have to recycle it for our future webinars. Uh, perhaps you guys can take a picture of everything you're lugging with you for us uh, as uh, part of uh, this webinar. Uh, and uh, we're going to be sharing the recording of this webinar. Um, so if uh, some of you had to drop off, well, you would know this now, but if you um, want to share this with colleagues, who weren't able to join, please do a look out for the webinar recording. We'd like to thank you all for attending. For those of you who are interested in receiving a professional development hour, the code is listed on the slide visible right now. If your question didn't get answered or you have additional questions, feel free to email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Uh, and with that, we'd like to thank Bruce and Laura for taking the time out of their busy days uh, to launch the findings of uh, the study on our webinar. We're very excited. And we invite all of you to join us as the first team members uh, to get information about upcoming webinars and to get those photos of what's in their bags. So have a great day, evening, uh, or morning, wherever you may be. And thank you again. <laughs>